America, 1776. The land is abuzz with revolution, and you, my friend, you are supporting the British. That's because you don't live here, you live here. You're a Shawnee Indian, and to be honest, you kind of prefer dealing with the French, but when it comes down to it, the British have been so kind as to only conquer the eastern seaboard and leave your homeland and everything west of the Appalachian Mountains as Indian territory. God bless the British Parliament. They may have caused untold damage around the world, but at the end of the day, all they wanted was to export as many knickknacks and addictive drugs as they could. Which isn't to say the British wouldn't have broken their promises in a heartbeat if they smelled profit, but they were, on the whole, much more amenable neighbors than the Americans. Sadly for you, the Revolutionary War was not profitable for the British. They decided to pack up and call it a day. And for the people living west of the Appalachian Mountains, the treaty that put an end to that war was not great for them. The Thirteen Colonies are hereby recognized as free, sovereign, and independent states. And we get to go fishing in Newfoundland! Fine, yes, you can go fishing in Newfoundland. I call Florida. Very well! Spain, you shall have Florida. France, you'll get nothing and you'll like it. Are we all in accord? One question, one question. Are you using any of this land out west? Are we using... Hmm... What was all that land for? I could have sworn we had... Hmm... No, you can have it. All right! Oh, uh, I thought they were going to stay east of the mountains. You mean they're... I mean, I'm in charge of the Mississippi. They're going to be on my border? That's not a problem for Spain, is it? You did want the Americans to defeat the British Empire, didn't you? Uh, right. <laughs> then it is decided. On behalf of all the nations who fought in the war, and all the people living in the Northwest Territory, it hereby belongs to the Americans. Well now, you've got a problem. The Yankees are coming in droves, the US government is finding all kinds of ways to run off with more land. Your nation is just too small to stand up to this imperial power. Wait a second? An imperial power who wants to rule your land without representation? Your tribe, your nation, your state, if you will, is too small to stand up to them alone. But there are lots of tribes. What if they were united? Hello, I have been paid by Magellan TV to ask you to use the link in the description to watch documentaries for free. Now you might ask yourself, what's in it for me? And I want you to know, I hear you. The truth is, some of you aren't ready for their thousands of high quality documentaries. Let me be clear. If you hate American Indians, you should not watch the story of Pocahontas or watch Maya, Ancient Metropolis. If you hate history, you should check out their nature and true crime catalogs. But if the thought of learning repulses you, you should not watch Magellan TV. Because there is not one title available that does not use the drama of real life to show you something new. But if not, please. Go to MagellanTV.com slash Jack Rackham and sign up for your all-access free trial. Or give the gift of TV worth watching. Pick up a Magellan TV gift card, available year-round, but especially good for the holidays, eh? If not for me, do it for the children that I've forced to model for emotional stock footage until every last viewer has done their part. Won't someone think of the children? Thank you. Our story begins in an unexpected place with a prophet named Tenskwatawa. Tecumseh's brother, Tenskwatawa, had a near-death experience and devoted his life to a new religious doctrine. You know, it's funny, it's easy enough to imagine him on the pulpit in the town square, but I always wonder what it would be like to be the first person proselytized, because at some point Tecumseh must have had a conversation with him, like, Hey bro, what's up? Been talking with Jesus. Dope. No, I mean like, talking with Jesus, you know? I have been given a vision. We have to reject Western culture, their knickknacks, their addictive drugs, their modern technology, all of it, and embrace tradition. Such is the will of God. Neat. Little did Tenskwatawa know that in about 50 years, a failed Chinese bureaucrat would have the exact same idea, but make it better by becoming Jesus' brother and adding sick anime swords. Anyway, Tenskwatawa takes to the streets and starts preaching his new faith, and most people think it's pretty stupid. There's a man named Karakahasa who would rather adapt to American culture and negotiate with the United States government to set up a permanent home for the Shawnee in their homeland of Ohio. And most of the Shawnee are on his side. Which is why today, uh, 
uh, there is no federally recognized Shawnee homeland in Ohio. They, they all ended up in Oklahoma anyway because of ethnic cleansing. Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Something about this image, I keep thinking he's grinning at me. Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa take whomever would listen to them, and together they all move west to Indiana. So named, because this time, definitely, this was going to be the last place that the Indian tribes would have to move to. Together, the two brothers found Prophetstown, which quickly becomes a bustling city-state of sorts, bigger than most American cities in the area. Now, Indiana today, uh, does not have any Indian reservations. Even before Prophetstown was founded, the U.S. started buying up land from different Indian leaders, often after placing them in debt. And things became particularly heated after the U.S. bought some 30 million acres of land in the Treaty of Fort Wayne. Here's the thing to know about that treaty. There were a bunch of different tribes living on that land, and the U.S. had sort of decided ahead of time that they were going to get this land, so they pretty much only invited the Indian leaders they knew would say yes to come and negotiate the treaty, and then claimed that they spoke for all the leaders that they didn't ask. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but basically the Indiana governor, future President William Harrison, sat down and sort of got the Potawatomi to twist the Miami's arm, and then the Miami twisted the Wii's arm, and then the Wii kind of twisted the Kickapoo's arm like a really uncomfortable game of Ring Around the Rosie. That Tecumseh gets involved in all of this is a bit of an oddity, given that Prophetstown wasn't even in the land that got sold. But given the ultimate fate of Indiana, it probably wasn't hard for Tecumseh to see which way the winds were blowing. And this is where we get back to the idea of this sort of second United States of America, or United Tribes of America? They just call it Tecumseh's Confederacy, but it could have been so much more creative. Tecumseh was hardly the first person to think along these lines. If you've ever heard of the Iroquois, not actually a single tribe. They are a confederacy, although they formed before Columbus reached the Americas. Then there's Joseph Brandt. Joseph Brandt was an Iroquois who formed the Northwest Confederacy in 1783 when Tecumseh was a teenager. Ah, just look at her. Isn't she a beauty? When Britain pretty much sold out a whole bunch of different tribes by offering the Americans everything up to the Mississippi, Brandt traveled throughout the West, promoting a pan-Indian identity, saying that to negotiate on even terms with the U.S., every Indian tribe in the Northwest needed to join together. And he created a confederacy big enough to step up to Congress and say, Don't do it! Red line, don't come any closer! So the U.S. signs a treaty saying that they won't come any closer then immediately forgets about that treaty, tries to pretend the Confederacy doesn't exist, and then invades. So that was the framework Tecumseh was working with when the U.S. started buying land in Indiana. Tecumseh argued to Governor Harrison that no tribe was at liberty to sell their land without the unanimous consent of all the other tribes, and that an attack against one was an attack against all. And boy howdy did he make himself known. Do 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 governing governing sing in my governing song as long as i'm the governor nothing can go that's a lot of indians what ho come to tussle eh we come in peace in fact i'm here to protect you protect me that's right the tribes are about to be unified any chief who tries to enforce your treaty is going to get what's coming to him make sure your people know it's dangerous to move in now see here, sir. This is the question of states' rights, don't you see? Shouldn't every tribe have the right to make its own negotiations with our great nation? Why, if the great spirit had meant for the tribes to be united, don't you think he would have given you all the same language at the very least? This guy. This guy, I ought to kill you. I'll pass along your sentiments to the president, but I don't fancy your odds. Tecumseh was fired up. All he had to do now was actually unite the tribes. Easier said than done, when he didn't even have the full support of the Shawnee. Like Joseph Brand before him, he had to travel throughout the land, and believe it or not, he did find his audience. But as soon as Harrison learned Tecumseh had talked the talk before walking the walk, while well, you might as well have put a billboard in front of Prophetstown that reads, Our best general is leaving us undefended, please leave a message. And a message he would leave. Harrison decided to make a preemptive attack on Tecumseh's capital. He parked his army outside and demanded to speak with their leader. Tenskwatawa, the city's spiritual leader, agreed to come out the next morning, but decided to make a preemptive attack. Harrison's army holds firm and secures a resounding victory at Tippecanoe, a battle that made him famous enough throughout the states that he coasted into the White House on that fame nearly 30 years later. Tecumseh returned to Prophetstown. 
Tenskwatawa, you're fired! But Jesus! FIRED! The United States considered the battle a crushing blow to Tecumseh's confederacy, but Tecumseh wasn't done yet. Prophetstown was burned to the ground, but hostilities never really stopped. Even while Tecumseh was trying to regroup and reorganize his forces, random soldiers were just running off into the frontier to launch raids on American territory. But Tecumseh was waiting for the right moment. If only the Americans would lock themselves into another war against a global superpower. Extra, extra, United States at war with Great Britain, something to do with sailors, I think. The War of 1812. Tecumseh comes knocking at Canada's door and the British welcome him as an ally with open arms. He strikes a fast friendship with the British Major General Brock, and the two have a super cute bromance. You should see the way they wrote about each other. They successfully lay siege to Detroit and the Americans surrender without a fight. Tecumseh! Was there ever a more sagacious and gallant warrior? Brock! Now there's a real man. You know, the way things are going, well, not to get your hopes up, but they're talking back at home. Talking about an officially recognized state for your people. If the Americans try anything, you will have the full backing of the British Army. And then Brock was sent off to Niagara and died. The British then called a timeout and let the US focus all of its efforts on Tecumseh and the Northwest Indian tribes. And when the British came back, they sent in General Proctor. General Proctor was not Major General Brock. Tecumseh and Proctor make several attacks on American forts that seem to get nowhere. Meanwhile, the Americans are closing back in on Detroit under the command of who else but William Harrison. Proctor is continually retreating and changing his plans, and all Tecumseh can do is reply, whatever you say, as he gets shot in the arm while trying to slow the American advance. Eventually, it's time to take a stand. Their forces are outnumbered, but it's not the first time Tecumseh's fought the Americans at a disadvantage. Proctor, though, well, the British half of the army collapses and Proctor runs away, the Americans charge the Indians and kill Tecumseh. Without its leader, Tecumseh's confederacy crumbles. It's true that uniting was probably their best shot, but, well, the 13 colonies were all founded by the same kingdom and had an extremely similar culture and the same language and religion, and they were a bickering hot mess. Trying to coordinate dozens of different nations and fight against a country trying to divide and conquer at the same time was a Herculean effort. But you might say to yourself, hang on a minute, the War of 1812 was the one where the British burned down Washington DC, didn't they win? Well, they didn't lose. But that's about as much as you can say. And when it came time for negotiations, WE SHALL NOT YIELD WITHOUT THE CREATION OF AN INDIAN BUFFER STATE TO PROTECT OUR INTERESTS IN CANADA. No. Well, we tried. 